baby, you listening to the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week my guest is one of those skiers that defined what halfpipe skiing was all about in the early 2000s. He was a household name in the world of action sports, and then he retired and seemingly vanished. I'm talking about Simon Dumont. Now, I don't know Simon Dumont too well. I did have interactions with him over the years, and my takeaway was that he came off as a really cocky dude, and he can back up that cockiness with what he did on his skis. While I wasn't the biggest fan of my perception of his personality, I was a huge fan of his skiing. He was so good that he could be cocky and get away with it. Another thing about Simon is that I always assumed he had a Napoleon complex, as he isn't the tallest dude in the world. But what I learned is that in Simon's case, whatever complex he had fueled him to work harder than everyone else. It's something you can hear in his voice and the calculated and off-the-cuff things that he says. Simon is a smart dude who is one of those people that sets unrealistic goals and crushes them every time. And after chatting with Simon, I like him now. I mean, we aren't going to go out and have beers or anything. But this podcast totally changed who I thought Simon Dumont was, and it will be interesting to hear what you think. Before we get into it, I need to thank both TGR and MSP for hooking me up with tickets to their premieres in Seattle. To tell you the truth, TGR was last week and it was great, and I haven't seen the MSP movie yet. It's later this week, but I'm not going to hold off on my intro, so I will thank them now and say their movie was great. One thing I do know about the MSP movie other than it's somewhat of a different cast of characters than last year's flick, is that my sponsor Stanley is supporting it. If you don't have a Stanley pint glass, then you are blowing it. I use mine almost every day and it keeps my drink cold for four hours. I want you to use one too, so please do you, me, and the show a favor by heading over to Stanley PMI and buying a pint glass, or even better, a set. When you use the code TPM30, You'll get 30% off anything on their site, and no one makes a better pint glass than Stanley. I also need to thank my other amazing sponsors who make this show happen. They are Evo, Spy Optic, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. You'll hear a little bit more about them later. Last but not least, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram and reach out to me at mike at thepowellmovement.com with any questions, concern, or feedback you may have for me. That was a lot of intro. Now, it's time to chat with Simon Dumont. Do you remember the first time that you and I met? To be honest, my brain is a little fuzzy. Who knows if it's from all the head injuries, but no, I don't. Well, your brain could be fuzzy from this as well. I'll describe the scene. Maybe you'll remember it. It was the U.S. Open. I'll say it was 2003. You were at a K2 condo with about 20 other skiers that were really young. You were really young as well. Everyone had a spliff either rolled or lit. I come downstairs from my condo, which is a couple floors above. I walk in, and it's just a cloud of smoke. Everybody shuts up when I walk in, and I try to play cool dad, and I'm like, hey, guys, you can smoke weed. I don't have a problem with that. It's just when there's 20 spliffs in a small condo all lit at once, we're going to get in trouble. And you know what? Outside, it's nice out there. Anybody can go take a walk. And you just stood up, looked at everyone, and you're like, I've got some lactic acid buildup. I'll go out on a walk. And I don't know if you were being a smartass or not, but do you remember that at all? I'm not 100% sure. 2003, at that time in my life, I didn't smoke or drink or anything. So probably just being a smartass, I would assume. Yeah, you were probably the guy in the room not doing anything and being the smartass to me. Yeah, I'm sure I felt a little uncomfortable at that age in my life with a bunch of people smoking weed around me. But where else was I going to go? That's the ski industry. I'm sure you experienced it many more times throughout your career. For sure. And seeing you back then and looking at your career, it seems to me that you went from a young, cocky kid with a chip on his shoulder to a very confident, business-like dude, but you still seem to have a chip on your shoulder. Do you see anything like that, or is that me just judging you from the outside? There's lots of interpretations, and I mean, I guess, at what aspect you're going to analyze things from. And me, obviously, knowing myself... I could say that I was maybe more insecure than anything, which I think with most people that can maybe get to that place of misinterpretation of cockiness could be a lack of security within themselves. And that may have been it for a lot of my life. From a young age, I had numerous people tell me that I wasn't going to 
achieve the things that I thought that I could achieve. I was a very small child. Like I wasn't a huge in stature physically. So that was always a deterrent. I was always the smallest and I always felt like I had something to prove. So there's two options there. Either you can use that as a crutch and hindrance and be like, I will never be anything. Or you take all of those things. And for me, I used it as fuel to manifest whatever it was that I wanted to achieve. And it, it seemed to do okay. I'm sure there's other ways to do it, but those were the tools that I had at my disposal. So it's almost like if you were six one, you might not be the same Simon Dumont. Maybe not. It's funny. I always had a brother that was 18 months older than me. So he was a little bit bigger, uh, a little bit stronger, a little bit faster. I wanted to compete with him or do everything that was he was doing, except obviously I was a little smaller. So he would get a bike and they got me a bike, but I couldn't get on it. So I had to figure out how to run beside my bike, jump on it and then pedal it. I always felt like I had something to kind of either prove or I didn't really want any excuses for maybe what people may have saw in me as maybe hindrances, I could say. Okay. And that's the intro of the podcast, the toughest part of the podcast that we would have because you brought up your height. I didn't bring up your height, which is perfect. I can take it all day. I've been short my whole life. If I haven't coped with that yet, then holy, life's going to be quite the conundrum if I'm still battling with how tall I am. <laughs> Did it ever really bother you, though? Was there like a Napoleon complex that you hear about? I mean, when you're younger, for sure. And I used it as fuel. All right. Well, let's talk about Simon Dumont before you became Simon Dumont. You come from Bethel, Maine, and that seems like it's pretty much Canada. Growing up there, does it feel like you're in the middle of nowhere? It's hard to tell. I didn't grow up anywhere else. It was actually amazing. Now that I look back on it, I was very fortunate. Obviously, when I was in it, for me, it's easy to acclimate to whatever environment you're in. And I can always think like, oh, outside of here is going to be so much better. So yeah, growing up there, I was like, ah, small town. There wasn't much to do. I wasn't really like partying or anything like that. So we got into a bunch of mischief, but... It was very fortunate. I grew up on like 70 acres of land, started driving dirt bikes when I was three, four wheelers, endless exploration. I'm pretty grateful for the childhood that I had. You're Native American, I heard, which would make you the greatest Native American skier to ever put skis on, I would think. When you put it that way, I guess so. <laughs> Just want to throw that out there. Yeah, I am Native American. And that's actually kind of crazy because I visit my tribe back in northeast Maine and it's quite an eye-opening experience. It's very poverty stricken and I actually went and spoke there once and I was trying to just hit home the fact that what we said at the beginning of the podcast where don't let your circumstances or people define the route in which you can take in life because I mean I didn't have everything handed to me. I battled some adversity and I had a goal and I achieved it. So I was trying to give them some hope because a lot of people don't leave that area. So it's a very humbling experience to go back there and see a different perspective of the world. It's interesting that that never became a story around you, that you were a Native American. And I would think the media would look for any story. And I guess they ran with the Tanner story, but that would be another one they could tell around you. Yeah. I mean, there's millions of stories. That's what's funny about the sport that we were in. That format, that medium, that the media itself is a tough thing because you're on TV for two minutes at the bottom and X Games run, or you do an interview for an hour and they cut it into two minutes. And then all of a sudden, these people think they know who you are through a couple actions that are happening within your life. Like at the bottom of half pipe run, I could be there and I can be bummed. My mistake is going on to a website and reading the forums about how people perceived that. Now, hindsight's twenty twenty. I would never even care about any of that, but I did when I was younger. And then they would say, how could he be upset? He's skiing for fun, and it's such an amazing thing, and he should just be out there having fun, and blah, 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 blah. And the difference is, it's my job. Yeah, <laughs> That's the big difference. And I want to win. I'm not there to just have fun. I'm there to hopefully be the best and change something. I'm not just there to have fun. Like that was my mentality. Yeah. Speaking of media, I heard you did some child modeling when you were younger. Is that true or is that just a rumor? 
Who the heck have you been talking to? I have tons of sources. <laughs> I did. My parents were always supportive, throwing me into all kinds of different avenues. And I did this Model Search America thing when I was super young and got an agent, went to New York, lived in New York for three and a half months. And Whoa. Yeah. It was a cool experience. I didn't do anything crazy. I might have gotten a couple little gigs here and there, but it was another cool experience in my life. Yeah, man. You've always been in the spotlight, it seems like. Well, I guess when you weren't in the spotlight was probably your gymnastic years, but you probably were because I'm guessing you were really good at it. I just, I guess if I said I wasn't, it would be false humility. You're an elite athlete who's better than everybody at almost everything. And <laughs> while it may seem to you like you're being cocky saying, oh, yeah, I was really good. We expect that because you are that elite athlete. So don't feel like you're puffing your chest. It's just a conversation. It's the truth. Were you good at gymnastics? I felt like I was doing really well. I mean, I was the best in the tri-state, the region. My mother always thought I was going to go to the Olympics for gymnastics. And I had a passion for it. The thing that was a bit of a hindrance was I wasn't really big on people telling me what I should do and how I should do it. Maybe that's an underlying theme with some of these skiers here where we're quite rebellious in nature. I didn't enjoy all the constraints. I was 11 years old and I was driving an hour to go to this gym and we were doing strength sessions and all this stuff. It just got a little too crazy for me. And I wanted a little bit more freedom, I guess, to kind of create my own thing. Sucks the fun out of it, I would think. In the creativity aspect, which I think is kind of cool about when I came into free skiing. Coming into skiing, you started as a little kid and your brother was snowboarding. Did you ever think about snowboarding or was it just you're going to ski and chase your brother? I was always kind of into skiing. I never really saw it as much. I just kind of enjoyed it. Some of the cooler kids did it and they were even better than me. And I started getting into it. And I remember learning 360s off little side jumps, which we do on the East Coast. Lift poles? Oh, yeah. You can find anything to trick off onto ice and it's insanity now. But then I remember learning my first 360 on a tabletop. And when I had that experience... I hit that jump a million times that day because that's just in my nature. As soon as I wanted to learn something, I did it. I ingrained it. So it was second nature, but it was such a cool experience for me. Like even with the lapses in my memory that I've been telling you about, that is like something that still is pretty significant in there for me. Are there other sports that you're playing? Any team sports? The big one for me was soccer my junior and senior year. I was hooked. I didn't really play too much earlier. And then I really got into it. And I realized I actually had some talent and I just enjoyed the game. And it was cool because there was that team component to it where you actually had some camaraderie and it's a different environment. And I was really into it. And I actually was going to go and play in college. I was actually enrolled to go to school. I had everything set up. Everything was ready. I was going to college. And then my parents left on vacation for two weeks, and while they were gone, I made the decision not to go. At that point, you're already a very big success in skiing, so I would think it's easy to be a professional skier there. Yeah, I mean, I'd already won X Games. Yeah. I won a contest in Sweden. I'd already started making some money. And the other aspect is I felt like I learned a lot through traveling. It's hard to teach experience. Yeah, for sure. Back to other sports real quick. People like you who are supremely talented at sports, you're born with a God-given ability and you develop that throughout your life. You can do a lot of cool things. I've heard you can do layups by putting a gainer into it. You can flip on one leg, either leg. What other things can you do that are like circus tricks? I wouldn't say the physical aspect. I don't know if that would be the thing that I would point to as much as more the psychological aspect of being able to do certain things. Because I'm under the belief that humans have the ability to do anything that they want to do if they're willing to make the correct sacrifices to bring to fruition whatever it is they want to achieve. Because that's the thing. When I put my mind to something, I literally made the decision that I'm willing to die to achieve whatever. I'm willing to make the ultimate sacrifice to achieve my goals. That's the difference. Like a lot of people are like, oh, I want to be really good at playing piano. Do you or do you want it to be easy? Because you can play piano if you're willing to sit at it and play for hours and hours and hours. 
And I mean, I did that when I was six years old. Like I remember somebody telling me in baseball that I would never pitch because I just didn't have the arm. So I would go outside and I would just throw a baseball against the wall over and over and over and over. I wouldn't take that as reality. And that's a certain mindset that I think people like yourself have. I mean, that's very rare in this world. You're saying that anybody can will themselves to do anything. I can't do half the things that you've done on skis. And I feel like even if I practiced and practiced and practiced, my body is just not capable of doing that. And that's just me being a pussy probably, but that's the (laughs) truth. It's an interesting mindset that you have. And just hearing that, it explains a lot of what you were able to achieve in your life. But eventually, when you're younger, you head out to California with your family for a snowboard contest that your brother's in. The trip's the one, I think, that starts changing everything for you. You meet Johnny DeCesare. You meet Greg Strokes. You're like 13 years old. What's the interaction with those guys? Are they just so excited to meet a little kid? When anybody sees a little kid doing tricks that are crazy and getting out of the pipe, it's more exciting than seeing an older guy do that. I was there for my brother's snowboard nationals. So this was my first real experience outside of Maine. And once you ski outside of the ice coast, I mean, it was slushy, it was warm, it was sunny, the jumps were big, and I was just skiing. And I think I watched the ski movie Los Alamos. That wasn't the first movie I watched, but I remember like somebody had a DVD and I watched that and I kind of knew Yoon from that. And I saw Yoon there. I always liked Yoon's style. I never had huge idols within the sport. I always looked to Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan people outside of our sports who dominated whatever their discipline was for an extended period of time because I thought that was the true metric of success. But when I saw you and I was like, oh my God, that's you and Olsen. And then all of a sudden I saw them. They didn't know that we were competing. But for me, I just, just my mindset, I was like, okay, I got to do some cool stuff. And it wasn't, oh, something's going to come out of this. I was just like, they're doing really cool stuff. I'm going to try to do some cool stuff. So I was doing like straight up 1080, no grabs, misty nines. And it was on a, for me, it was probably the biggest jump I'd ever hit. So it was just a really cool experience. And then Greg Strokes came up to me, gave me his card and uh, talked to Johnny DeCesare a little bit and actually rode up with, I think it might've been Tanner and Yoon at that time, rode up the chairlift with him. And it was just cool experience. I didn't see it as this turning point or the stars aligning or anything of that nature. I was just a young kid seeing other people throw down and I was going to do the same. From there, you find out about the X Games qualifier at North Star. You either do well enough or you're persistent enough with calling event organizers that you get yourself an alternate spot in that. Yeah, I think I got fourth place in the qualifier, which is funny because I think I learned a D-spin seven that day. (laughs) So I learned like a couple tricks during that contest and yeah i ended up getting fourth so i was the first alternate or something and we obviously made some phone calls and had people around me that were kind of trying to help me get in there and i think it was appealing to have maybe a 14 year old kid in the x games because i mean even if i don't do all that well it's still kind of a cool story so i think there was some sort of an appeal there in that first x games you throw your first nine ever and i think the first nine is in a contest run It was, yeah, the last jump. I was like, okay, well, I I can do seven, so I guess it's just another half rotation and ended up landing, and yeah, I guess you could say the rest is history from there. Yeah, and it's such a ballsy strategy when I guess you're a kid, you probably don't have a strategy at all. You're just probably like, I can get that extra rotation in. I had nothing to lose. I wasn't there with like, oh, if I don't make it on the podium, I'm not going to make this sponsor happy, or I'm not going to get TV time, or I'm not going to get a victory schedule. If you're 14 years old, I'm not thinking about the future. It's, hey, I'm in a run. Oh, I'm going in. I'm, I'm going to try something. My mind was a lot more empty at that age. And I was skiing with a different mentality than the one I did as I grew and made this more of a job, which may have been a mistake on my part, but it is what it is. And I'm where I am. So apparently nothing happens by mistake. Now it is time for me to take a quick sponsor break. My first sponsor is Evo, and if you haven't been to Evo's stores in Seattle, Portland, Denver, or Whistler, or visited their website, evo.com, you are missing out on the best deals in action sports and beyond. Evo has something for everyone in the family, and they always have a great sale going on. They carry all the best brands in bike, surf, skate, wake, ski, and snowboard, 
and have all the clothing and outerwear you'll need for your adventure or just to look great when it's time to head back to school or the bar. Right now, you can find some great end-of-season deals on bikes and surfboards and check out all the new ski and snowboarding gear that's hitting the floor daily over at Evo. Evo offers free shipping on orders over $50, a low price guarantee, and a no-hassle return policy. Please support the show by buying everything you need from Evo. My next sponsor is Stanley, another iconic Seattle brand that has been ahead of the curve since 1913. While we all know Stanley for creating that iconic green bottle that kept your grandpa's coffee hot all day long, they still do that and a lot more these days. They still are all about adventure. They still are all about keeping your beverages hotter or colder than any other product ever created. And they have always been the right choice when it comes to the planet. If you are still using single-use plastics for your beverages, it's time to make a change for the environment. And now I'm making it easier than ever to do that. You can save 30% on all Stanley products when you head on over to stanley-pmi.com, buy some stuff. When you check out, enter the code TPM30. That's all one word, no spaces, and you're done. Those are my sponsors. Before we get into talking about contests too much, because the masses know you for the contest, but the core ski crowd, you've always been more than that. Film-wise, I think you started with level one. You film with Osnes, you film with Poor Boys, Matchstick. I don't know who else you filmed with. You're one of those guys that bridge generations. You skied with the first, second wave of new school skiers, and then you became your own generation and passed the torch. Do you feel like you cross over generations? It's funny that we're even having this conversation because I'm so detached from the person that I was to the person that I am now. When I even think about a lot of the things that I achieved, it's hard for me to even assimilate because I'm such a different person. When was the last time you were on snow? I skied last year for the first time in two and a half years, and it was because a bunch of my friends from Miami that I play volleyball with who crushed me on the volleyball court and humbled me to a very extreme extent wanted to come out and ski, so I needed to put them in their place, in my world. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, so that was the first time in a while. That makes sense that life is totally different now than it was then if you haven't skied, being that skiing was your entire life for over a decade. Yeah, and I'm under the perception that we inevitably were going to die, so it, it makes me realize that I should experience some other things in life. I mean, I've traveled the entire world. I've skied more than the majority of people will ever ski in their lifetime. So with that notion intact i really am enjoying experiencing a lot of other things and it's cool trying a bunch of new things yeah you can learn things so much quicker when you start at the baseline of zero rather than to learn something in skiing it was like i had to risk a lot to get a little bit of a gain but now in a sport like beach volleyball i can learn something every single day and it's as if i'm almost childlike again which is a really cool experience and it's nice to be humbled because as you said yeah i mean People tell you you're freaking awesome since you're 12 years old and you get paid exuberant amounts of money to travel the world. I challenge you to not have your head get a little bit big. Good luck. When people look at people like Justin Bieber and they're like, how can he act better than that? Why don't you get a billion dollars when you're 21 years old and see how you act? I think he's doing okay. <laughs> Literally, I would tell the world to fuck off, burn some shit to the ground and like peace <laughs> out at 23. So I mean, <laughs> It's crazy. Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. But it is nice to humble myself when I play sports. I remember in Miami, there's five main courts where everybody plays. I was over on the tourist court and just looking over watching people play. And I was in that same mindset, but I was a 29-year-old man. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get over there. And it took me a lot of time, a lot of work. But I was like, I made it over. But it was very humbling to start at the bottom again, which was a cool experience for me. In the beginning of your film era, per se, the one movie that sticks out to me is Teddy Bear Crisis. I look at that as probably one of the greatest ski movies ever made next to the Guatemalan Persuader. In that movie, you overshoot a table by about 100 feet and you're out for a while. You fractured your pelvis in three places, ruptured your spleen and injuries are part of the game. But that's one of the first serious injuries you have. I don't think there was a great evacuation plan there for you. Was that just a miserable, miserable experience? I'm going to digress from that question. I'm going to hit it in a minute. But a lot of people know me from my competition skiing. And that's the difference about that error. We did everything. It was like, 
you skied half pipe, you skied slope style, you did big airs, and then you went and filmed for the rest of the year, and you just covered every aspect of skiing because that's just what it did. There weren't disciplines. It was just you skied, and you tried to be the best in all of those different modalities. And filming was probably my favorite part because competition, for me, it's I'm going to let go of a little bit of style. My key goal is that I'm going to land my run Because if you don't land your run, it's hard to do well. So I was willing to maybe sacrifice on a little style and make sure I landed my run. But when you film, it's really cool because you can do something and you're like, oh, my hand waved on that one. I'm going to try it again. I think there's a lot more creativity and ways to express yourself within filming. That was always a huge component of my life. And I really, really enjoyed that aspect. And I'm sure if I would have stopped competing and filmed... I'd probably still be skiing, but that wasn't the case. Back to that Park City experience, debacle, I call it, the travesty of a jump that they built. A jump like that wouldn't even be built nowadays. It was this flat takeoff with the steepest landing on earth. I think I was 18 years old. I hadn't fallen in like a month and a half skiing. I'm talking like off a rail. My hand didn't touch the ground. I was skiing on this level that was I could define it as biblical. I can't come up with a a better word to describe it. My head was a little big at that time, but it was because the actions were saying that. I literally was skiing on fire. So I was like, okay, I'll go hit this jump. Six in the morning, terrible idea, no helmet, sled toe in. And we're just like, okay, let's do it. And I was like, I'm not going to hit the knoll because it was so icy and cold. I was like, I'm not going to hit the knoll. Let's try it. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to hit it. As soon as I was in the transition, I was like, this is going to go terribly bad. Yeah. I knew it. I was like, oh my God, I'm going way too fast. But I couldn't stop at that point. So I was like, what am I going to do? So I went from the right-hand side of the jump to the left-hand side of the jump. So I was trying to cover more area, like laterally rather than just out. So that was my first thought. And then my second thought was like, I don't know if anybody's had this dream, but if you're a skier... I've had the dream where I overshoot an air hill and I land flat. Mm -hmm. And that's what I felt as soon as I hit the takeoff and I went over the knoll. I was like, oh my God. And I was like, okay, how am I going to land the best way that I can? I was like, okay, let's try and hit my feet and collapse to my side. And that was all happening within, I mean, it, it, it wasn't even happening consciously. Now that I can look back on it, I mean, that's what our memory does, especially in traumatic times. We can actually break things down a little bit more. And that's why I remember traumatic times a lot better than other circumstances. Anyway, so I landed and I made a hole in the ice with my head with no helmet, three inches. And then I wake up and I'm like, oh, my groin kind of hurts. So I thought I just pulled my groin. I didn't really realize the implications of what just happened, but they let me stand up and walk to the snowmobile. Oh, Yeah, which is insane. And then... June put on his pink coat around me. So I'm already hurt. And then I have this pink coat on. (laughs) I'm just kidding, by the way. And then I get in the back of a car and they are going to drive me home. And all of a sudden I start feeling like maybe I broke a rib, but apparently that was my spleen that exploded. Went to the hospital, ended up peeing blood. And yeah, I realized I fractured my pelvis in three places, ruptured my spleen and spent five days in the hospital. For most people, that would take them out for a long, long time. But for you, I think it's two months. That sounds impossible. Yeah, it's crazy because I have this unique ability to disassociate with different things. So like when that happened, I was there, but I didn't have this traumatic, traumatic experience. It was like, oh, that happened. It was the jump. It was this. It was that. And I always believed that I was going to be fine. I was still under the belief that I was invincible, which is... I guess kind of a blessing, but what a day when you come to the realization of your own fragility, because that happened later on in my career. And that's maybe where some doubt creeped in. But that point in my life wasn't even a blimp on my radar. That's crazy. The only other video part I'm going to talk about, I think it was in the Grand Bazaar. It was the cube pipe. And a half pipe section in any video to me would sound pretty boring. But the pipe that you guys constructed for this, can you describe the pipe? For some reason, I was known as a half-pipe guy because... Because you won. Yeah, probably because I won a lot. And I didn't even really enjoy half-pipe that much. The only reason I kind of did it was because that paid the bills. And it made it so I could go and film the rest of the year. And 
I actually liked hitting jumps better and doing all of that stuff, but I apparently had a knack for it. So I wanted to try and shoot a half pipe segment and I just didn't know how to do it without, as you said, making it boring. So I, I had this idea. There have obviously been channels, but what about if we made the whole thing a channel? So I skied the pipe for a day. I mark out certain areas and then you cut away everything that I'm not going to ski on. And the thing with me is I come up with some of these ideas because even the quarter pipe, the quarter pipe and the cube pipe may have been the two scariest things I've ever done in my life. The thing about the cube pipe was Red Bull put in so much money, so many people putting in all this work. And then I show up and all the pressure is on me alone. Yeah. That's the difference than like, oh, I'm in a contest run. Okay, I better land my run because I want to win, whatever. It's a different type of thing when I showed up there and it's like the pressure's on. And you know what's funny? The first day, I couldn't get past the third hit. And the other thing that's kind of sketchy that I don't know if people realize is I have to go 20 feet the first time I hit it. There's no speed check. There's no anything. It's as if I'm dropping in for my contest run with no practice, with two channels that are missing. And I'm like 45 feet off the ground. It's like, you got to go. And I'm like, okay. So the first day I couldn't get past the third hit. Demoralizing. And I had some gnarly crashes. I didn't sleep at all that night. Most terrible night sleep ever. The only thing that was going through my head was code. Dub 12, right 9, dub 9, alley-oop 7, switch 7. It was just going through my head over and over and over and over. And I was just visualizing and crashing. And it was just the most traumatic night ever. But I wake up the next day, and for me, a thing that was always great was I could always channel anger pretty well. So if I could find something to piss me off, for some reason, I could focus and ski like no other. Huh. Here's the thing. I did the cube pipe. I did it once, and I was relieved. I'm like, I'm not going to have to do it again. The helicopter missed the freaking shot. Oh. Yeah, and they're like, oh, do you mind doing that again? It's like, do you have any idea what I just did? Right. I don't think you can fully comprehend what's going on with me. Like, I just survived. I dodged a bullet like the Matrix. And now you're just casually saying, maybe go up there and do it again. And when they said that, I was so livid. And I could have just stormed off and caused a scene and told Red Bull to F off. But that's just not even close to what I was thinking. So I just went up and I just hammered it out. And I got it like three more times in a row. And then once I was done that, talk about a relief. They're the ones that gave you that anger to channel it. So it's good that they asked you to do it again. It's good they missed the shot. There's a perspective. But that was the same thing with like the quarter pipe. That was another thing. These ideas that come up in my head that seem so easy. But it's a lot more that went into it than I think people can easily interpret by watching it. And we might as well talk about the quarter pipe now. The whole idea comes around 2007 or 8. I think you were at Aspen and they have a huge quarter there and you're boosting on that. I don't know if you're aware of the record or not, but you realize that you're going really, really high and then you end up separating your shoulder. And is that the shoot that's like, hey, I can set the world record. We should do this. Yeah, like when I did it there, obviously I knew there was a point that Terrier went huge on a quarter pipe and I know there are different modalities. Somebody's forward, somebody's sideways. There was just a mark out there. That was just the highest mark on snow. So it wasn't like I'm like, oh, I'm going to go beat Terrier and blah, 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 blah. There was nothing about that. But once I started going big, I was like, oh, wow, this seems like this could be kind of easy. But once you get to a certain point, it gets pretty gnarly because the room for error, every like mile an hour you bring in, your precision for your pop has to be, as I said, so much more precise. And that night was not the night. And sometimes I get carried away. It's like, oh, all of a sudden I get in the zone where sometimes I even black out. Like, I don't remember doing the quarter pipe, by the way. And I don't remember a lot of my half pipe runs because I just get into this zone that I don't know if it's fully conscious. But either way, I got in that zone and I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. And then like kind of a gust of wind grabbed me, caught the coping of the deck, separated my shoulder. It's not the best way to go in with a, a goal and an idea. But that night I said I could probably break that record. And usually when I say something, I like to follow through. So then the whole plan comes together to do this at Sunday River. So you're bringing it back home. They build a monster quarter pipe for you. And it's the whole situation again, where people are taking a month out of their time to put things together to make sure Simon Dumont can achieve his goal. 
I think the first day or so you end up bruising your heel, you end up looking for a numbing shot or something to take care of the pain. Are you able to find something for that? Yeah, it was terrible. They never built a quarter pipe that big. They left 90 degrees vert on it. Obviously, you can't put vert back on, but you can take vert off. Right. So it was super over vert. And I'd never skied anything with such a huge transition. So I was going small. It was like, oh, mellow, mellow. That vert's fine. But as soon as you started going bigger, like that's when all those little measurements really make a big difference. And I was trying to do cork fives. And usually you travel from right to left. But I was going alley-oop because I was absorbing so much which I didn't even realize. And then, yeah, I went probably 25, 26 feet. And yeah, just popped a little hard and landed so deep in the flat bottom, bruised my heel, hurt my patella tendon, and the doubt creeped in. And then the weather turned crappy. So I had like six days of just dread. Not ideal to just be in an anxious state for six days, but whatever, I guess. And then the day I came out, that wasn't my goal. I was like, okay, the quarter pipe's built. I'm going to at least get some shots. Okay. That was my goal. I'm going to get some shots. And then all of a sudden, I started doing 900. And I was like, oh, huh. And then I just started going a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And then all of a sudden, like something just transformed and it took over. And then I went pretty big. I thought it was it. And then there was this guy, his name was Bear. And he had this inclometer. He's this, I hate to say hick, but I mean, I'm a hick from Maine too. So he's just up there like, oh, that wasn't it. (laughs) Because I thought for sure it was it. Like, it felt huge. He's like, no, that wasn't it. And I was like, oh, you motherfucker. And once again, I used that anger and I went back up. My helmet was unbuckled. I wasn't there. And I don't even remember doing it. But I remember landing it and people just losing their minds. And I was like, oh, my God. Once again, I said I was going to do something. And I achieved something that I didn't think was humanly possible. But I did it. and that fully built the idea that I could achieve anything. It reinforced that idea that I had. Who has the quarter pipe record, you or David Wise? I think the internet spoke for that. That's why I didn't say a word. It sure did. I was going to make this whole podcast about contest stuff, but hearing you talk about contests not really meaning that much to you other than paying the bills, There's really not that much I want to ask you knowing that. I mean, you win the X Games in 2004. You win the X Games in 2005. At this point, sponsors are coming. You've got Solomon. Do you hook up with Solomon through Jenny, who was known as the Solomon and the team manager extraordinaire? She came on later. You were early. Yeah, it was a little bit before that. What other brands do you get on in the height of your career? Who's paying you? Because you have some of the best sponsors out there, I feel like. I was very fortunate. I still have a really good relationship with my agent, Michael Spencer. I will say now, I don't think I could have been a quarter as successful if I didn't have him with me as somewhat of a father figure. Because I traveled the world mostly by myself, which my parents, I can't even fathom how hard that was for them to let me grab my ski bag at 14 years old and fly off to Sweden. But Michael kind of came in and filled that role and he went way beyond agent athlete relationship. I mean, he literally helped mentor me and went up and beyond just getting me amazing deals. But he did get me amazing deals nonetheless. So I mean, I had Solomon, Oakley. One of the biggest ones was when Target came in because that was the non-endemic sponsor. It was somebody outside of skiing because everybody had these ski deals. Everybody was getting pretty good money, but then this non-endemic sponsor, like somebody like Target wants to sponsor an athlete. And that kind of changed things a little bit because as you started this podcast off with, when you're talking about smoking weed and this certain image of what a free skier is, Target doesn't want that image. They are a corporate brand. Yep. I'm honored to be incorporated with a company like that. I mean, we went to St. Jude's Hospital. We did all kinds of really cool things, but there was also a responsibility, which was tough to find that balance being a young kid. But thankfully, I had some good guidance. And then there was like Toyota, there was Nike, there was Visa, there was Sprint. Red Bull was beyond amazing. Giro head at the end there. Like I had so much support. It was unbelievable. And it was a golden error too, because I talked to my agent now. I can't even say my agent. I'm going to say my good friend, Michael Spencer. I talked to him now and he's like, the game has changed. 
way more athletes, way gnarlier, way less money. You were in the golden era. And I know a lot of people say that, like, oh, I remember the good old days. But literally, I hit it so perfectly. And you were Michael Spencer's first client, I feel like. Uh, I know he had some other clients in some different elements. I know he worked with some triathletes in different sports. But yeah, first action sport client, I think. From what I gather, 2006 is the biggest year in terms of contest winnings for you. I don't think you did well at the X Games that year. You might have been hurt. I'm not sure. But I think you made over like 150 k in contest winnings. With all the brands that you have sponsoring you, do they match those winnings as well? It all depends. All contracts were structured very differently. Like I know a lot of people had photo incentives and all these different things. For me, I did have a pretty good victory schedule because it's hard for people to pay certain amounts of money up front. And that's the thing. That's what's so cool about our errors. Like Michael came up with a lot of really cool ideas to figure out how to get me paid the most and make the people that were above understand it. Instead of just being like, okay, well, this is what he's worth. Pay him this retainer. He's like, okay, I guarantee you he's going to get this many covers. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. Because I was. I wasn't the athlete that was like, I'm just doing contests and you're not going to see me the rest of the year. I'm filming. I'm getting covers. I'm doing the cover of ESPN. I'm on Ellen. I'm doing all these other things. I'm a brand. I saw myself as a brand. So I was trying to put myself out there in as many ways as I can. And Michael was the key component on how to facilitate the monetization of my brand. Now it is time for me to get into my final set of sponsors, and I'm going to start with Spy Optic. Spy has spent the past 25 years innovating the sunglass game, but more importantly, they've spent 25 years making you look good. The artists, athletes, and designers over at Spy not only live and breathe the action sports lifestyle, they like to party and try new things. And the newest of new is the 5050 collection. Spy took the iconic frames, the Flynn, Discord, Cyrus, and Helm, and took their bottoms off. Literally. They stripped down these popular frames, leaving them semi-rimless and ready for some action. It's an awesome upgrade to the glasses I already love. And if you wear sunglasses and listen to this podcast, support me, save some money, and make yourself look good by heading over to Spy Optic. Pick out some sunglasses. I highly recommend the Helm 5050. Head to checkout and save 20% by entering the code POWELL20. That's all one word and the number 20. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They have been brewing my favorite Northwest beer since 2006, and they have a couple of new flavors that I'm going to tell you about. The first is Profuse Juice, a hazy IPA that kind of reminds me of Out of Office. It's got a great flavor and a percentage of sales benefit the Surfrider Foundation. The second beer, Smash, is a lighter wheat ale that I drank a ton of while I was in Bend. You can't go wrong with either of these beers, and they're great to drink outside. And Ten Barrel is all about drinking beer outside and supporting all things snow. You can find out a lot more about the company and the beer over at Fully Aligned. That's Ten Barrel's brand new podcast that lets you peek behind the curtain over at Ten Barrel. Next time you're at the store, buy some 10 Barrel and support the brand that really makes a difference in the sports we love, the 10 Barrel Brewery. Those are my sponsors. Now we are going to get back into the podcast. Are you smart with your money? Do you buy houses, cars? I know you had a restaurant. I don't know if you still have one. You had a glove company. What things are you putting your money into to make sure you're going to be okay today? I was very fortunate. I had had great guidance. Like As soon as I started making money, I wasn't under the delusion that I was going to make money in this endeavor forever. So my dad was an independent contractor. So I mean, I bought up a lot of land in Maine. I did buy a restaurant. That was actually something I did for my parents because they supported me forever. And then my mom and dad had this idea of a restaurant. And for me, that is not a business that I want to get involved in by any means. Right. But they wanted to do it. They were very passionate about it. So I said, okay, here's the money to do what you want. And it's not because I'm looking at this as the most amazing investment that I want to just make all kinds of money on. I'm doing this because you guys have supported me forever. And then lo and behold, they crushed it. Right place, right time, great management, great location. My dad's a contractor, as I said, so he built things up. My mom managed it. We sold it in five years, made exponential returns. And Yeah, it worked out amazingly. And then my other money, I've bought 
numerous homes. I just bought a new place in Park City, diversified different mutual funds, index funds, uh, my own stock account, the cryptocurrency phase. I've dabbled with a little bit of that. I'm under the belief that if I want to make more money, I can. But at the moment, I would say I'm retired and I'm searching out different things for fulfillment. Because I don't know, I guess the end of my career is not as a happy of a story as one may say. Well, you've put yourself in a position to be happy. And that's really what's important because some people don't think about that during their careers and they're fucked afterwards. But the fun part with money, it's something that's totally different than what the athletes are doing today. But with your crew back then, you guys were bona fide rock stars, it seemed like. And while there is a business aspect to you and you're always getting your shit done, you guys like to have a good time after the event. There was the 10% rule. I don't know if you invented it. 10% of your winnings would go to a bar tab the night of the event. You were winning a lot. You probably spent more than anyone else. How much do you think you spent on the 10% rule? And what's the most memorable memory? You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, the golden era. Like I can easily talk about it in a monetary sense. I can talk about it with filming and half pipe and slope style and all these different things. But the other part was the community and the lifestyle. Because I mean, as I said, I started traveling when I was 14 years old. And I mean, I met people like Peter Olenek, TJ Schiller, Josh Bibby. I can add the list. It's infinitum. Like it can go on forever. So I mean, my best friends I traveled with around the world. And the cool thing was somebody would win. And that somebody would probably be your friend. So we would all go out and celebrate and have a great time. And did it get out of hand at times? Yeah, maybe if I look back on it, maybe I could have done something different. But some of the most amazing times I've ever had in my life. I had my 21st birthday in Vegas in Target, Red Bull, and Oakley paid for it. Can you not tell that story now? Because that is going to come up a little bit later. Oh, okay. Did you talk to Peter Olenek? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, we did party a lot and we had a lot of fun. It was part of the whole deal. And I mean, I never even drank till I was 18 years old. So I mean, I didn't even indulge in that party aspect until I kind of went on the road with all these people. And it was part of the whole culture. You skied hard, some harder than others, and then you partied hard. I think the defining thing with me was that I always performed well. That was like one of my big goals because it's very easy to get distracted by all of those things that we're discussing now. But I made sure that I still performed well. Do I think I might have been able to perform well if I didn't indulge in a lot of those things? I may have, but I don't know where the line is. And it may have been crossed a bunch of times, but I don't know if I could have done it any different. Okay. Signature events were something that became a big thing in skiing. You had a signature event as well. I'm not going to talk about your event. I'm going to talk about the best event that ever happened signature-wise, the Yoon Olsen Invitational the first year, it was just a photo shoot with a big air contest. You were rooming with an all-star crew. I think it was Sammy, Wallace, Amet, Colby. Was that your first Tom Wallace experience? That may have been my first experience with Wallace. Obviously, I knew him from his videos and edits. But yeah, that was the first time really hanging out with him. That first year, it was a different year. It wasn't as cool as I would say the next couple of years were, but I'm sure it was still great. The video that you enter, it starts out with you letting the air out of Yoon's Lamborghini. While that's funny in a cringeworthy way, it's a Lambo. What did he say to that? I think he was okay with it. I don't know about him, but we ragged everybody. I felt like everybody kind of ragged on each other and gave each other a hard time. We're like a, I hate to use the word frat because that's just so many negative connotations tied with that. But we were a group of friends who traveled the world with each other and pushed each other's buttons and we all have egos and we're all competitive. So, I mean, we stirred the pot a little bit. And me, I may have been a habitual pot stirrer. So I hope he thinks it's all in good fun. And I know later on with some of the, the Joss stuff and my competitive side, there may have been some animosity there from both sides and maybe not respect given where it should have been given. I've apologized to Yoon and I haven't seen him in a long time. And I help our paths cross because I felt like he was somebody who took me under his wing at a young age, which was a really cool experience. The thing you're talking about, I think, is when you pick Tom Wallace to be part of your team, you have an amazing concept. You have Tom Wallace as Jesus, and I love it. Everything's so funny about it. 
but I guess you guys released the footage early and some people got pissed off. The reason we were kind of pissed is because I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but Team Canada ended up winning and their edit was freaking insane. By far, production wise, was the sickest. But they didn't ski quite as much as a lot of us did. Okay. They did ski and what they did shoot was amazing. But there wasn't a lot of extracurriculars. Like Tom and I were out there building wall rides and hitting rails and a lot of other teams were doing those things. So, I mean, of course, me being competitive and not ending up where I wanted to end up and being a little immature in the way that I conducted myself, we released the footage early, which it is what it is. Obviously, as I said, if I could go back and maybe do something differently, would I? I'm sure. The man that I was at that age, that's what I did. And yeah, it may have caused a little bit of turmoil between Yoon and I. Well, there's many things that you could regret. That's not a terrible thing by any means. So not something that should live on in your conscience by any means. You're still killing it on skis at this point. I'll say like 2009, you're the AFP world champion. But I think the highlight of that year for a lot of core skiers is the Slumdog Illionaire edit. How did that thing come about? That's hilarious that that's the biggest thing that I did because I was just skiing in the park. And I thought it was kind of hilarious. There are parts of our culture that are ridiculous. <laughs> there are some things that I see, some of the tall tees outside of on the hill and all these different things. Yep. They're hilarious. Like from the outside perspective, you'd be like, you're a ridiculous person. That's <laughs> funny. Now I'm like, cool, be you. But they're just funny aspects to things. So I was like, okay, I'm going to kind of do an edit that's kind of poking a little fun at it, but not really because the style component of it, I align with that. Like I like that super baggy kind of landing with an attitude. I really enjoy that style component of it. Like somebody like Henrik Harlow, watching him ski still now, I don't watch skiing very often, but when I see him ski, I'm like, oh, okay. And then Tom Wallace at the time, he was another one. Yep. Like I was watching him ski and getting all this publicity for putting out edits just in the park, which I was like, I didn't even know that was a thing, but he did it. He's a savvy man when it comes to social media and being an early adopter of these different platforms from YouTube to new schoolers to Instagram to Twitter. And I think that that's why he's going to make money off skiing for a long time, even if he's not skiing. But once again, I digress. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to make a ski edit. And it was nothing crazy. And then all of a sudden, it's like a million views or something. And people still talk about it for some reason. But it's funny to me. Well, in the next five years, we want a Slumdog Illionaire 2. That would be greatly appreciated. We'll fast forward to 2010 or 11-ish. I think you break up with Solomon. We've been going for a while, so I'm not really going to ask what happens there. But you end up on head. And I would think when Head picks you up, they're focused on, and you're focused on, winning an Olympic medal because a healthy Simon Dumont can do that. The problem is, over your career, we've talked about highlights, but not too many injuries. And the next few years have been spent hurt more than skiing, it seems like. So 2011, the year we're referring to, that year I pretty much podium almost every event I ski in. I didn't really do much spring skiing. I didn't film a lot. So I don't know if I was in the best head space. And then the whole Solomon debacle, that was more just, I think, higher ups not really understanding the value of this small niche culture. Now I can look at it from like a business perspective and I can be like, oh yeah, no brainer. I understand it. If you're somebody who's not in touch or has the pulse of this community or how it kind of works. And I mean, they did a big rebrand anyway. It's not like they had a lot of park skiers, like they went kind of backcountry and they changed their identity a little bit, which was weird because they had the sickest team of all time. So then I had to go to head. They wanted to do everything for me. Amazing. But I did ski on a ski for 11 to 12 years. I learned how to ski on a ski. And I mean, I can ski on anything. You give me a piece of plywood and I'll make it work to a certain extent. But when you're going 25 feet out of a half pipe doing tricks that you're hanging on by a thread, that ski change isn't that easy. And the first ski that I had was like a rocker tip. Hmm. Trying to do a switch hit in the half pipe with a rocker tip. I mean, my switch hit went to shit. No pop whatsoever? It was just hard. And trust me, they were doing everything. They were making 
so many molds. They were doing everything at their disposal, try to give me what I wanted. But it was hard. It was a hard switch. And I started to lose a little motivation. It's like, what am I going to do? I'm going to go podium at another event that I've already done. I didn't have the drive that I had. It was losing its luster for some reason. I don't know what it was. I mean, maybe it's my age or my transition, or maybe it was because I sacrificed everything in my life to be the best skier that I could be. And you know what that means? I sacrificed friends. I sacrificed family. I sacrificed every single thing in my life. The only thing I was living for was skiing. And if that wasn't giving me what I wanted it to give me anymore, I wasn't in a great place as an individual. It sounds so sad. It is. You listen to the story as, as a child. Well, achieve what you need to achieve. Be the best at something. Get the money. Get the girl. Get the house. Get the car. Achieve, achieve, strive, do all these things, and you're going to be happy, free, and serene. I achieved everything I thought I needed to achieve as a man. I've done things that only one man in the world has ever achieved. And I got there and I was like, oh, this is it. I felt like something was lacking and I didn't have the capacity or the humility to figure out what that was. But that's what my journey has been like for the last five or six years. And it's changed my life exponentially. So the Olympic dream isn't enough to keep you motivated anymore. Dude, I wasn't even, the only reason I was thinking about the Olympics, like I didn't care about the Olympics that much. There was kind of a tiny part of me that was like, you can make some more money and you can maybe set up your future forever. But it's like even the Olympics now, yes, it might be the biggest venue with the most eyes, but it's not the best skiing. You get four people from the US. It's like, how many great skiers in the US? And then you get four skiers from this country and country quotas and all these different things. So I think the level of skiing at X Games was even higher, but there was the notoriety. It's the biggest stage in the world. Exactly. I was thinking more about it from a monetary aspect, which I don't think is the right motivation. There was a little part of me that wanted to be like, oh, I'll go and I could win. and It would cap off everything. But then I probably would have ended up killing myself because I would have done everything I ever thought I needed to achieve in the world. And I still would have been like, meh, like not as, I can't even articulate what it is that I have now. That wasn't the place to look for it. It worked for an extended period of time. Now that I look back on it, I'm really glad I didn't go to the Olympics. It's almost like if you pulled the plug in 2012, you'd be a much more comfortable person, although you're not thinking about doing it back then because you end up blowing your knee, you come back from that, I'm sure you're a rehab machine, and then 2013, you end up breaking your wrist, your left hand, your right hand. That makes it so you can't even jerk off, which is terrible. <laughs> that setback doesn't stop you from competing at X Games, and you take third, you're on the podium. I look at that as you're passing the torch over to Torn and David, and that's the end of your competitive career, pretty much. Yeah, I was miserable. I was miserable. Even that X Games, I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm still doing this. Because I didn't have a reason for doing it. It was just, I had no other avenues. As I told you, I put all my eggs in one basket. I think a lot of athletes get their identity tied up with whatever it is that they're doing. So then, like I say, a football player retires, and then what does he do? Yeah. That's what I am. I am a skier instead of like, oh, maybe I can be a good son or a good boyfriend or all these other components and facets of life that are just infinitely wonderful. But I didn't know that. So that's why I hung on. And the thing was, I had eight surgeries in three years. I couldn't walk for three summers in a row. And then sickly enough, I would break both my wrists. So I couldn't use my legs in the summer and then I couldn't use my hands to jerk off in the winter. It's like, what the hell is going on? And still, even with all of that, I couldn't be like, I'm just going to throw in the towel because I'm too damn stubborn. And I continued to plow through for some reason. And you know what else was the tough thing? Imagine eating all those painkillers and dealing with that whole phase while you're in a terrible place. And it's just the freaking ingredients for a state that I wouldn't want to put my most malevolent enemy in. Do you get to the point where when it's time to go to the hill, you're not excited at all? Like it's a hassle and you're frustrated you have to ski? Oh, for sure. It was a job. And especially that like Olympic year, it snowed every contest. It was freezing. It was snowy. It was terrible. Yeah, ski contests are fun when it's sunny and it's kind of slushy and it's warm and there's no wind and the pipe's perfect. Yeah, okay, cool. That's not the reality. 
What about when you practice and you crush it, and then all of a sudden that night it comes in and snows eight inches, and your biggest asset, which is amplitude, goes away, and then all of a sudden the field shrinks a little bit more, and you still have to wake up at five in the morning to get up there to ski. Your body's not even warm. You're cold as shit, and then you have to go do this gnarly stuff. Oh, yeah, that's glitz and glam. No, it doesn't sound fun (laughs) at all. No. (laughs) It's got its moments for sure, but it doesn't sound fun at that spot in your career. But you're still in a prime spot to make the Olympic team, which is crazy enough. You have two contests left. You're training for one. You feel a pop in your knee and poof like that. You know you're not going to the Olympics. Here's the funny thing about perception. That could have looked like the worst thing that ever could have happened to a man. I tore my ACL a couple weeks before the Olympics. My sponsors and every source of income that I currently had was going to be cut off. I had no direction in life. All these things were piling up on me at one time. So just exuberant amount of chaos. And little did I know that that was going to help transform me into a man that I'm so much happier to be. And it doesn't look anything like the man that I was prior. That's what's funny, too, because people from the outside would be like, oh, my God, previously you're traveling the world and you're doing this and you have everything that somebody could imagine. That's the best life ever. And now people would probably look at my life now and they'd be like, oh, it looks pretty good. But they don't know truly, fundamentally, the transformation that has occurred. I listened to your whole story and I had a conversation with David Wise. It kind of sounded similar where... Halfpipe is something you do so you can ski everything else. I mean, it doesn't even sound like you like it that much. I mean, I'm sure the feeling of some airs is pretty amazing, but that's the way you pay your bills. And coming into this interview, I thought you would have been crushed that you weren't able to get to your Olympic dream. But it sounds like relief at the end of the day, which is a totally different thing than I thought. I mean, at the time, it wasn't relief. Now that I've gone through the process at the time, it was like one of the most detrimental and crushing trying times in my life i had to fully reformulate the structure in which i perceive the world and that is not an easy task like i literally i mean i I hate to use the resurrection motif but i literally had to die and like reformulate who i was and that was not an easy journey and trust me there was a lot of people that were there that loved and supported me and helped see me through a pretty hard time in my life but now that i'm on the other side if i can overcome a lot of the things that I overcame and achieve a lot of the things that I've achieved in my life, then I'm just excited to see what lays on the other side. What all that sacrifice and what all that determination, how that's going to transpire throughout the rest of my life. And now after you've kind of gotten through the couple rocky years of realizing that not everybody's going to call you and tell you how great you are every day and do everything for you, do you seem like you're in a good spot and life is good? You're an entrepreneur, I believe, who's retired, but will probably dabble in different things. Life's good, though? Life's pretty amazing. It's kind of awesome. I live in Park City in the summer. I live in Miami in the winter. I pretty much wear board shorts every day in Miami. I don't have a car there. I walk to the beach. I play volleyball every day. I have a girlfriend who's amazing, loving and supporting. Great relationship with my family. I have some friends. I don't pick up my phone often, which is nice. That's different. I don't have people telling me where to go or what to do. I get to help people in my own way. And there's been quite a shift in perspective. All right. Well, I think it's a shift in a good way for you, especially at this age. One question I forgot to ask you is let's say that you, Tanner, Dave Crichton, and CR, and David Wise were all perfectly healthy. You had a perfect pipe. Who would win the contest? Oh, my God. I thought you were going marry, fuck, kill. No. Uh, (laughs) That's a good question because it depends at what time in our careers. Were we all at our peak of our career? All at your peak. Ooh, that one's tough. The thing that I can relate with Tanner about, and even Dave, but Tanner and I, because I skied against him more, we were always the last one in the pipe. We were always getting the last run. I could see him like channeling that anger and that focus too. So there was something about Tanner that I could really relate with. When comp time came, I knew he was going to land his run. And he knew that I was going to land my run. And Dave Crichton, I got to ski with him, which was amazing. The way that guy's brain worked and how he saw different facets of skiing, he was an anomaly. CR, I never had a real close relationship with, but wow, did he go big that one year. And then David Wise. I don't know him as well personally. He seems very motoric to me. 
I think it would be one hell of a contest. Let's put it that way. At this point in the show, I have something called inappropriate questions. I talked to someone that you know, and Peter Olenek right now, he is coaching the North Koreans. He's coaching the Red Bull athletes. He was a former competitor with you and part of your crew. Let's go with the first inappropriate question from Peter. Here we go. Question number one is, Simon, what was the best part of your 21st birthday? Whew. The best part of my 21st birthday. Well, we were lined up to go into this one club. Maybe it was in the Bellagio. No, the Venetian. We were lining up. We were going to go. There was like 35 of us rolling deep. And somebody in our crew threw a glass over the railing, which was a dumb, dumb thing to do. And it like smashed and they weren't going to let us in. So all of a sudden there was like 30 dudes just like chanting my name as we were being escorted out of this place. (laughs) There was too many of us that the security guards were close enough to like kind of think they were reeling us in. But I was like Caesar hoisted above everybody. And and maybe there's some significance with where we were, but it was just hilarious. People were chanting my name. And then we ended up over at the Palms at this amazing VIP room. And it was just like an amazing night. I do not want to go back and do my 21st birthday in Vegas again. But if you're going to have a 21st birthday, make sure it's sponsored by Oakley. Target and Red Bull. And I can't even fathom how they got away with the amount of money and the things that they spent money on. It was insane. Let's just put it that way. I won't say anything else. (laughs) Happy birthday to Simon. We will go to question number two. Question number two is Playboy Mansion. Tell me about it and how did the night end? I hate you, Peter. You're dead to me. (laughs) It was another really cool experience. I don't know how that came about cool to be able to say oh yeah i went to the playboy mansion how the night ended will have to be kept under wraps i don't know i plead the fifth (laughs) well i'm gonna say it was a rabbit fur blanket in your bed let's go with question number three simon did you ever go to sayulita and would you go back why or not oh that's the most terrible experience i've ever had in my life peter planned a trip with just I can't even articulate it. I mean, I could, but let's just say I'll never go back to Sagalita again. It rained for a week straight, and it was just, I can't even get into it. Nope. I hate you, Peter. That's the worst trip ever. You're the worst planner, but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So those are inappropriate questions. I want to say I've always been a huge fan of yours, just your skiing. I didn't really know you, and Based on our first experience, I didn't think you were the coolest guy to me, and I didn't really care either way. I loved watching you ski, and hearing this whole interview, it just gives me a totally new perspective on who you are, and it's pretty awesome, man. I thank you for your time, and that's the podcast. So that was time with Simon Dumont, and what an absolute badass that dude is. I didn't know what to expect from this interview. Was Simon going to be a smartass? Was he going to be cocky? You know, was he going to be the dude that I thought he was? And what a pleasant surprise. I was totally wrong about Simon. Sure, he had a big head at points in his career, but he does a great job at explaining why. And I don't know. I left this conversation so impressed with Simon's ability to will and work his way to success. I mean, he wasn't supposed to make it as an athlete. Maybe a horse jockey, but not a multiple-time X Games gold medalist. He proved all of his doubters wrong. Simon is one of those guys that I will never bet against. Once he sets a goal, he is going to achieve it. While he is retired now, people like Simon seem to get antsy when they have too much free time on their hands, and I anticipate seeing big things from Simon in the future. And it really doesn't matter what he chooses to do. Once he commits, it's going to be a success. So really interesting chat with a misunderstood person. And that's the show for this week. Now I want to thank you for listening, ask you to subscribe to the show, and tell your friends about it, and also... Please support my great sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Evo, Stanley, Spy Optic, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.